Okay, everyone, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I just wanted to wait a few minutes. There's some folks coming over from the East School and some coming from even further away. And so I just wanted to give a couple extra minutes for those folks to make it here. Um, I want to introduce myself really quickly. My name is Dan Obayi. I'm a, uh, I was going to say a postdoc, I'm not a postdoc. I'm just a new assistant professor here in the department. Uh, and I'm going to be one of the co-instructors for this course. Hi, I'm Mackenzie. I'm the other co-instructor. I'm a fifth year grad student in Stephen Cagliari's lab. So excited to get to teach. Yeah. Uh, we also have a slate of great TAs for this course that's going to help make this course run really smoothly because there are times where I tried to take on a lot of the workload and it did not run smoothly. So I think we have a great teaching team and I want to introduce them really quickly. These are our undergrad TAs, uh, Cooper and Ahaba. Uh, we have one more that's coming all the way over from Slaughter, and so she's uh, she's going to be here momentarily. But our graduate TA is uh, Nadra Laban. Uh, did I pronounce her last name correctly? Laban. Laban. Okay. I was say, I have a last name that is hard to pronounce, so I just want to mouthful that. Um, yeah, so we have a great teaching team, and I'm really excited for the semester, and I think it's going to be a great time together. Uh, I wanted to quickly go over what some of the course objectives for this course are, and we're also going to get a quick snapshot of what you'll be required to do before lectures, during lectures, and after lectures as well. So some of the key course objectives we're gonna be covering in this course. Uh, we're gonna be focused on acquiring the basic knowledge and central concepts of key cell and molecular biological processes. Uh, you can see really quickly that there are some terms highlighted in blue. Throughout the course of this class, uh, this class there's gonna be a lot of almost feeling like you're drinking from a fire hose a little bit. And there's gonna be times where I'm gonna try and focus your attention. Uh, I might even sometimes say like virtual asterisk here uh, if it's not in blue, but there's gonna be times where things are gonna be highlighted in blue. Those are gonna be things I'm gonna want you to really take note of and to really uh, uh, commit to knowledge. Uh, we're gonna be also identifying how some of these fundamental uh, cellular molecular biology concepts ties to human disease. For every lecture that we cover, uh, it's gonna be applied to some sort of uh, health issue or some sort of disease. Uh, for example, the next lecture that we're gonna be doing that uh, Mackenzie's gonna be covering is gonna be about amino acids and proteins and applied uh, to the disease of sickle cell. And so throughout the entire, uh, throughout the entire course, we're gonna be applying a lot of this to uh, various human diseases. And I know a lot of the folks in here are probably pre-med and so that probably is something that's gonna uh, be of interest to you. And also Nadwa's an MSTP student, which means she's an MD PhD student. So I'm also gonna rely on her a little bit for her clinical expertise to sometimes chime in here. Uh, so the next thing is we're gonna be combining a lot of different concepts from uh, different contexts to apply to different biological problems. So for those of you who are both either first years, particularly true with first years, but also true for some of the second years, uh, this is one of the key courses where you're, you're gonna have the first opportunity to take a lot of different um, concepts and piece them together to answer different uh, biological problems or apply them to diseases. Uh, one thing I should have said is that I was a BME grad back in 2011. And so I can remember taking this course. I can remember when I first started teaching this course, a lot of the slides were the same. So uh, we're trying to, up, we've been updating them slowly, but uh, I can speak from experience that this is one of the first courses where you get to really in a unique way, combine a lot of the different things that you learned either in physio, chemistry, physio, uh, physics, uh, and uh, calculus, which are all fun things on their own, and it's great when you put them together. And so, throughout the course, throughout the uh, throughout the course of the semester, uh, there's going to be a long project that you're all going to be working on, and it's going to be an opportunity for you to try and take what you've learned and apply it uh, to try and critique and evaluate current available clinical therapies, and through your project, propose a better alternative approach. Uh, and so what this is going to require for you is to take the content that you're learning in this course uh, and some of the skills that we're going to be going over in this course, <clears throat> excuse me, and try and uh, develop a project where you're going to try and identify a biological problem or disease, what the key questions or problems are, and propose an alternative that might be a better therapy or a better approach. And finally, uh, one of the key things to take away is that uh, we're, all, we're all gonna be asking you to try and uh, develop the skills to communicate these ideas that, that you have for your project and take these complex ideas and communicate them in multiple ways uh, that might be uh, accessible to a broad audience, which is kind of the classic BME uh, multilingual background that uh, we're all training you guys to have where you can talk to clinicians, engineers, uh, private equity firms or whatever. And so the, the idea is that you're gonna be asked to communicate it through, <clears throat> excuse me, 
uh, three different deliverables for your project that are uh, different forms of communication. So the uh, accessibility for us for this course. For, so for the instructors, typically what we're gonna try and do is we're gonna try and be here 15 minutes before class. Uh, I know a lot of the second years, I'm pretty sure, this is true last year, I'm sure it's true this year, that a lot of you are stuck in this room basically all day. Uh, I see kind of depressive nodding. And so I'll, 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 I'll assume that's still true. Uh, so because of that, and especially because uh, each Thursday, we're, uh, we're gonna cover this later, but each Thursday we're gonna have a short quiz before each lecture. That's typically, that typically what that means is students will wanna try and ask questions before the quiz. And so we'll try and be available 15 minutes before the lecture. Uh, and then also after the lecture, uh, the teaching team will be available to answer questions as well. And as well as accessibility, I should also say, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand at any point uh, if, you, if you have any questions. Um, we're all, each member of the uh, teaching team is gonna have dedicated office hours. Uh, and we're trying to, we're still, uh, we're still coordinating what those office hours are gonna be right now, but we're trying to make sure that it, there's as little overlap as possible so there's various options available that can accommodate everyone's schedule as much as possible. Uh, mine are gonna be in my lab. So if you go straight out this door uh, and go through the, uh, you need a health badge ID to go through the double doors directly across the hall. But my lab is right down there in room 1227. That's where my office is. And so I'll be available Monday through Friday, or sorry, Monday and Wednesday uh, from 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, I should also say, I, uh, those, those are the best office hours I could find. I commute here from Richmond, and my van leaves at like 4. So like, I should probably say that's more like 3 to 3.58. Um, but uh, yeah, so those are my office hours. Uh, Mackenzie's office hours are from 4 to 5 Monday and Wednesday. And I assume... Most of you know where Wilsdorf Atrium is. I think there might be a couple students that are not from an engineering background. You want to quickly say where Wilsdorf is? Yeah, so Wilsdorf is on the E-Way in the engineering side of campus. So that's where my lab is. It's a little more accessible. And figured some of you might already be over there if you're taking other engineering classes. Um, my office is in the lab. So to kind of avoid any harsh chemicals or other things that might be going on, I figured the atrium is a good accessible spot with a lot of space. So um, it's... If you're walking down E-Way, um, that main sidewalk, not near the stadium, it's turn left. It's the first building behind chemical engineering. So if you have any questions or ever confused, I'm always going to be walking there after this. So you're welcome to walk with me. Thanks. Uh, I'm pretty good by email. Uh, so if you have any questions, you're always, always feel free to uh, send me an email and reach out. Uh, and I'm also free to uh, set up appointments to find a time to chat and either talk content from the class or talk projects when those really ramp up. Uh, what doesn't work well for me is random drop-bys because I might there's a possibility that I'm already in a meeting or not in the lab and out somewhere else. Uh, and so uh, I'll ask that, this is going to be true for the rest of the teaching team, that if you reach out by email uh, to ask a question or to want to set up an appointment, that's a great way uh, to use us as a resource to help you with either the content or the projects. Uh, so, as I uh, mentioned again, the TAs will have will have dedicated office hours as well. And once we uh, coordinate together and get those uh, scheduled, we're going to send that out to the whole class so you guys know one will be available to all of you. Uh, and last TA, Shri, I was uh, introducing all the TAs. That's Shri back there. Uh, she's one of our other undergraduate TAs. And so, again, we have a whole teaching team that's here to help you guys. Uh, again. Uh, to get through, to get in the building, honestly, uh, but also get to the labs where my lab is, you wanna make sure you get a health badge ID. Uh, I know that some of the first years in the course probably don't have that yet. And so you can go up to the BME office on the second floor here in MR5. They'll have a form available for you where you can uh, fill it out to get a health badge ID uh, and to get access to MR5 and all the labs here. Are there any questions so far? I'm gonna take a pause to take a sip of water and give space for any questions. Are there any questions here? Looks like it doesn't know. All right, let's keep going. Uh, so lecturing for the course is gonna be split uh, between both of the instructors uh, as well as uh, the graduate TA Najwa. And so there's gonna be a whole teaching team that's gonna be uh, working to try and help uh, deliver the lectures. And so we'll all be available 
will all be available even if only one of us is giving the lecture. All of us will be avail available to help you uh, go over the content or answer any questions you guys might have. Again, for the best chance at a response here, uh, make sure that you're just emailing all of us. And I included, it, we included in the syllabus, uh, it is really easy for us to miss an email uh, based on if there's like no subject line or if the subject line just says question. Uh, in the syllabus, we actually have a recommended subject that's basically the course titles, spring, like BME 2014, spring 24. Um, and so if you include that in the title, that'll immediately uh, uh, raise our awareness to your email and want to get to it immediately. Uh, I can probably speak for everyone that on the teaching team that we get lots of emails and it's, uh, I'm also realizing more and more that my inbox is getting wildly out of control. And so as I'm sure some of you maybe realize who tried to reach out to me beforehand and I didn't get to you, so I apologize about that. Uh, but the recommended subject line will help elevate your email uh, and we'll get to you immediately. Uh, again, there's a lot of resources available to you for this course. Uh, one resource immediately is that every lecture will be recorded and posted to Canvas the same day. And so uh, that's going to be one key resource that will enable you to kind of re-listen to the lecture over time. Uh, but in addition to that, the office hours uh, really you know, they're really student hours. They're really dedicated uh, to be available to you so that you can be as successful in the course as possible. Uh, one thing I've been thinking about doing is charting, uh, doing like a correlative analysis of students who go to office hours and what their grades are, because there really is a big change of students who didn't go to office hours and who started going and their grades went up. Uh, that's not like an artificial change, but rather like them really getting to sit with the material actually talk it out and not just do like rote memorization. But, um, you know, this this course is going to be slightly different than the core engineering courses you took your first year because it's going to require a little bit, it's going to require you to kind of sit and work with the material a little differently. And the office hours are a great way to work through it. And honestly, it's one of the best resources available to you. So I highly recommend that you guys take advantage of it. So things to do before each class. Uh, there's going to be a pre-lecture video uh, for each lecture. Uh, they're going to be about 20 to 25 minutes long, and they're going to try and create a, a, uh, a common base foundation for every lecture, for each of the lectures we're going to be talking about. I, I should also say it's not for every single lecture. It's going to be a little front loaded. On the back end of the class, there's not going to be any pre lectures because a lot of what we talk about later on is going to be built upon the content earlier in the course. But on the front end, there's going to be pre lectures. And again, it's only 20 to 25 minutes long, about the same duration as a sitcom on Netflix. So you can replace this with that. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's only, gonna be, it's going to be slightly front loaded. So that's going to be one of the key things for you guys to do. We'll provide a YouTube link for you guys, uh, to access these pre-lecture videos. And again, closer to 20 to 25 minutes. Um, you will be held accountable for the pre-lecture material. That is going to be material that is, uh, uh, fair game, I should say on quizzes and exams. And uh, we'll give the context later on for what if desired means. But uh, there's going to be a 10-minute uh, quiz each Thursday at the beginning uh, of the, at the beginning of the lecture. And I know that some of you are coming from engineering from the engineering school. And so uh, what we'll try and do is I, I imagine there might be some students who are coming in around like the 205 time maybe. And so we'll try and be flexible with that as we get a sense of uh, as we get a better sense of when students are able to arrive uh, to accommodate that. Um, that commute. Uh, all of the quizzes and exams will be done via question press. Uh, it's going to be accessible either through your computer or even through your phone. Uh, probably a little more enjoyable to do on your computer. Uh, there's also going to be some questions that have like some sort of illustration. And so it might be easier on your computer. Um, we've had a few problems in the past, I think, with people who have used Firefox. So if possible, I think Chrome has been the most successful web browser with question press, or at least the one that had the uh, least trouble, I should say. Uh, because we're doing these on uh, online, please bring a charged laptop, or if you have a tablet, or if you want to do it on your smartphone, but please bring a charged electronic device, especially on Thursday, on quiz days or exam days, so that uh, running out of battery is not an issue we need to deal with uh, on, on those days. Uh, and typically the quizzes will only consist of about seven multiple choice or free answer questions. And so, excuse me, on, uh, it'll typically, we'll typically dedicate about 10 minutes to the quiz. 
And then after that, we'll typically, uh, they'll be graded immediately and you'll have, we'll have five to 10 minutes to discuss afterwards if there's any uh, questions or any issues uh, afterwards. I should say the questions come from a bank that's been vetted of questions. And so there shouldn't be much issue. Uh, there shouldn't be much need for deliberation on the questions uh, if they're not fair or if they are poorly worded. They're pretty solid, but again, uh, we'll be able to talk about it after the quiz. Uh, and we'll take a mock quiz later today. Not a pop quiz, just to make sure everyone can access question press fine. Not trying to scare you guys. All right, so like I said, there's, <clears throat> uh, earlier I said there's a, a quizzes and it said if desired. So the way the course is gonna work, up, work out is that you'll have, we'll have both quizzes and exams available. You will have the option to take either the weekly quizzes or to take the exams. So we'll, the way this will work is that there's gonna be four units in the class. And for each unit, you're gonna get like a unit grade that's gonna help you get a sense of like how you're doing. And so for each unit, you can either take the five quizzes that, or four quizzes, depending on the unit, or you can say, forget that, I just wanna take the exam at the end of the unit. Or you can take both and whichever grade is higher is your grade for that unit. Um, and so, it's typically best for you to decide at the beginning of the unit what your approach is going to be. Your approach can change from unit to unit, uh, but I just recommend that you decide ahead of time what your approach is going to be. Uh, each quiz will only cover that previous week's material. So quizzes are on Thursdays. It'll cover the previous Tuesday, Thursday material. The exams will cover that entire unit or that entire quarter. Uh, so like all of unit, uh, I think our first exam is mid-February. So everything in unit exam one, of, obviously, will be everything that's in this one unit. But the unit two exam will only cover what we cover after that exam. Uh, and I should say that the uh, last exam for unit four is not accumulative. It's the day of our final. Uh, but it's not accumulative. It's only for that last unit. So there's no cumulative exam for this course. There's no cumulative final. It's just that the last exam that falls on uh, the final exam day is for that last unit. Uh, and again, which if you decide to take quizzes and exams, whichever one is higher will be your, uh, your grade for that quarter or that unit. Uh, so I should edit this. Uh, so if you know you're gonna be out of town, if you know you have to travel, if there's some sort of commitment, uh, reach out to us ahead of time. We were more than happy to accommodate that and uh, and make sure we can reschedule to accommodate your travel schedule or something that comes up. Or honestly, I think uh, someone was uh, in the ER the day before an exam last year with an actual like emergency doctor's note. Uh, so like emergencies happen, things happen. Uh, I remember my third year, I broke my ankle and was like not mobile for a while. And so like things happen, please reach out and let us know and we'll be happy to accommodate it. Uh, it's hard to accommodate things if there's radio silence and you don't show up for exams and it's, it'll be hard to provide a makeup after that because the course is going to keep going and you'll have to keep keeping up. So I just ask you again, we are here to help you reach out to anyone from the teaching team and let us know if you need to reschedule a quiz or reschedule an exam. All right. Uh, the quizzes will be about four to five times in length compared to the quiz, uh, which kind of makes sense because usually the, uh, there's four to five quizzes uh, per unit. And so that means quizzes are about seven questions. Exams are about 28 to 35 questions. And again, uh, uh, let us know ahead of time if you know you're gonna miss it so we can reschedule and accommodate uh, accordingly. All right, so uh, as I mentioned before, this course is gonna be slightly different from what you've taken previously compared to the like core engineering curriculum. You're going to be applying a lot of combining a lot of different concepts and applying them in new ways. And so some of the questions have been dubbed tricky. Once the approach is appreciated, then they're less tricky and more of an application approach. But there's going to be we're going to do a quick verbal illustration all together to appreciate uh, what the questions might be like, for example. So all together out loud, that loud part actually helps. So. You know, make sure, hold your neighbor, account, uh, hold your neighbor accountable. <clears throat> I want all of us to say pots out loud a dozen times. All right, I'll say it with you. 
Pots, 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 pots. What do you do with a green light? I heard a couple stops. I'm not gonna call you out, but I heard a couple stops. So the idea is to think about what the question is truly asking. There might be red herrings in the question. There might be, you know, multiple choice where it's either um, all of the above or only A and D. Um, but you're going to be asked uh, to actually think deeply about what the question is asking you. And again, what the question is asking you, uh, and to respond accordingly. So, a lot of uh, a lot of traditional studying approaches. Uh, sometimes oftentimes work for some of the courses that you take up to this point where you're honestly uh, committing to memory really hard and having a regurgitative uh, brain dump and then forgetting the content. But again, the course builds on itself. So that approach is not great here. And so that uh, that's not the best way I would recommend studying for this course. Again, everyone probably studies differently. What works for each person uh, might not work for the, what, what works for one person might not work for the other person. But the approach that has worked best for most students that have taken this course is to sit down and like talk through the material, to actually uh, try and figure out in your own words how you communicate the concepts and to try and actually just understand it and not commit it to memory. Um, and so again, uh, if flashcards work for you and if that works for this course, go ahead and do it, that's great. Um, for most students, uh, memorizing things on a flashcard typically hasn't worked, but rather talking it out uh, either on during office hours or if a few of you are at uh, Health Sciences Library at 11 o'clock at night on a Tuesday, talk it out there together and kind of make sense of it together. Um, but again, uh, talking through it together, talking to the TAs, talking to the instructors, we're here to help you talk through the material and understand and see how these things, how these different concepts come together. Uh, and again, as we talked about with the illustration, think about the intention of each question uh, and not just pure recall. So for the projects, I'll stop there. I'm going to take another sip of water. Are there any questions about anything we've covered? Yes. Great question. Yes. When we have an exam, we'll start with a quiz. And if you're satisfied with your performance and you decide you're not going to take the exam, uh, after we're done going over the quiz, I will kindly excuse those who are not going to take the exam and you're done for the day. <clears throat> and the rest of you, you can, uh, and then uh, those who are sticking around for the exam will take the exam. But yeah, we're going to have, uh, on exam days, we'll start with a quiz. And then those who aren't going to take the exam are excused, and then we'll continue on with the exam. Thanks for that question. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah, you, you don't have to declare anything to us. It, it is a personal decision I'd recommend you uh, you make uh, and it'll inform your approach. But yeah, it will, it'll at the end of each unit, we'll post a grade and whichever one's higher, we'll let you know. Great questions. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, the question the the questions are uh, they're all similar difficulty level. They're all uh, covering yeah they're all similar depth yeah absolutely all right so for the projects uh you're going to have like one large overarching um hypothesis or question you're going to be you're going to be addressing and you're going to be communicating that idea you have in three different ways the first one is going to be a graphical abstract where uh, I'll be making available an account for the class on a um, on a website called BioRender. Uh, it's a really great uh, it's a really great resource for producing and creating uh, publication quality illustrations. And so you'll get a chance to uh, use that resource to create a, a graphical abstract or an illustration to communicate um, what your project what your project is, what you're addressing, and what your hypothesis is. And that'll be uh, your your project overall grade. Is going to be your projects are going to be thirty percent of your final grade. The graphical abstract will make up ten percent of your final grade. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if they 
on a regular basis, but because there's now like institutional access and licensing for BioEnter, they usually do a workshop, like an introductory how to do these kind of a thing once a semester, or at least they have the last two semesters. So keep your eyes out. And if they don't send it to undergrads, I'll send it to you guys last when it comes around. But just something to take advantage of so you get a nice primer for it and don't have to figure it out. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next uh, element of your project is going to be a three-minute thesis. That's going to be a three-minute video. Uh, typically, students use Zoom. Uh, and it's going to be a three-minute video where you're uh, incorporating your figure illustration, but uh, having three minutes in a compelling way uh, to communicate your the problem, what your idea is, and how you're going to do it. And so this is just another uh, mode of communication uh, that we're going to be incorporating in this class for you to communicate uh, your idea. And finally, uh, we're going to have a two-page research statement. I should pause and say here, um, this is going to make me feel really old. I took this class 15 years ago. Uh, and when we took it, it was a 30-page paper that we like worked on in groups. Um, it was due at the very end of the semester. You can probably guess when most students started working on it. Uh, and so the idea uh, is that we've redesigned the course to try and focus on skills that we think will be really important for you all to try and develop, developing different modes of communication, and also to leveraging the skills of each student here. Because some students might be really creative and might have great um, creativity skills, great illustrative skills, and uh, be a whiz. And if you, uh, you know, we're gonna make BioRender available. If, you're, if you know how to use Adobe Illustrator, have at it, that's awesome. Um, but the idea is that there's gonna be a peer review component in this, and so that we're gonna ask people to give feedback from one another and so we can leverage one another's skills to improve our abstracts, maybe improve our three minute thesis or improve the two page research statement. And so with a two page research statement, the idea is that it's a um, it's gonna fit the form of either uh, of the like NSF fellowship or the Harrison undergraduate research award. It's a two page paper where you're gonna be having an introduction, you're gonna be uh, providing your methods, you're gonna be providing your conclusion, and uh, not conclusion, you're gonna be providing these different components and we're gonna have small assignments throughout the course of the semester that help uh, address each of those components so we can help give you feedback, get feedback from one another, and produce a quality uh, product. And I should say, it was I'll, I'll be 100% transparent and say it was not the result of this course, but uh, two years ago, we had a student that actually won the NSF fellowship, which is a fellowship that'll get you into any PhD program in the country, probably. <clears throat> and so, you know, there's uh, the idea is that we want you to develop the skills again to be successful and to understand uh, what are the uh, what are the resources available to you to actually pr pursue research potentially or uh, to do these different project components at a high level. So you'll be asked to identify disease or problem of interest or biological problem of interest. That'll be the first assignment that you'll have where you're just uh, providing a, a brief paragraph identifying what you want your project to focus on. And the idea is that you'll be using primary references. Uh, so. Wikipedia will not be acceptable as a reference here. When we say primary references, we mean actual research articles that have been published uh, in research journals. And one of the great uh, resources, one of the great ways to go about finding those research articles is PubMed. Um, that's one of the best ways to go about finding those articles. Uh, another one that's available to you is called Google Scholar. That's another resource that you can use to try and find different primary research articles. But again, we are looking for primary references. These are research articles. That where they've done the experiments themselves to try and uh, test a specific hypothesis. Um, there are review articles that kind of give like a landscape of whatever maybe like area you're focusing in. And those can actually be really great to help you understand like what's the current um, current dogma or current mode of understanding within that domain or area. But we're gonna ask you to focus on citing primary references for, throughout the course of the semester a good place to start as far as like diseases and biological problems go is um up to date which a lot of physicians use to kind of like get the head to toe on any kind of like physical ailment um and so if you were to start there and get an idea of like what the current gold standard of care is what the physiology or pathophysiology is behind the disease and then use the references cited there to kind of like blast out into primary research that you could actually cite that's a very good like clinically focused one to start with thank you uh, hopefully this does not come as a surprise, but the project must be related to cellular and molecular biology. Um, and it's uh, the idea is that you know we'll have small assignments throughout the course of the semester that will help keep you on track. 
so that you're not focusing on everything the last week of the semester, but also to make sure that uh, your everything is uh, focused and relevant to what we're talking about in the class. And so uh, we'll give you feedback on the first assignment where you're identifying what you want to study. And we'll try, if it's you know focused the right way, we'll give you a thumbs up and say, keep going. If we just need to make a pivot to make it more relevant to the course material, more relevant to the course, we'll help you. Uh, the idea is that the, these projects are interrelated with one another. They're, uh, they're, they're, there's, they're, there's a relationship between them, but they're not, uh, they're not fully, they're in, but they're also independent. You're going to be working on them almost like in parallel at times. You'll be working, there's going to be a time where you'll be working on your graphical abstract and your three-minute thesis. Um, you know, as one gets better, you can, it can help make the other one better, but you're able to work on them at par in parallel at times. Uh, first, submission, first submissions of these will not be graded, but peer reviewed. Uh, and so again, we'll be leveraging uh, each other's skills to try and help uh, make everything, make all of our products better in the course. Uh, and that's the peer review is actually a really big component of research. Like all of the papers that we write and publish are peer reviewed, uh, sometimes for better or worse, but mostly for better. Um, but the idea is that uh, we want to try and expose you to kind of the, the dynamic of the peer review process uh, that is so critical to biomedical research. Uh, and then the final grades for the final product, you'll have a first draft. But the final draft will be uh, graded by the teaching team. Uh, your graphical abstract, you're going to be assigned to create an illustration that describes a problem uh, in your proposed therapy. Um, again, we'll be giving you access to BioRender, and when those workshops are available, and I'll uh, reference, we'll try and point those out to you if they don't, if they're not made immediately available to undergrads. Uh, but if you know how to use vector-based software like Illustrator, have at it, absolutely. Um, the expectations you'll incorporate this into the other projects. So you'll incorporate this illustration into your three-minute thesis. You'll incorporate it into your research, uh, two-page research statement. Uh, and the grading will be uh, based on submission of your first and final drafts, the accuracy of your science, uh, how creative it is, and the clarity of it. Are there any questions here? Great question. Yes, for each of these projects, for each component, we'll be providing examples of, uh, we'll be providing like really high quality examples. Um, one, a couple of the three minute theses that we'll also be providing. There's actually a three minute thesis competition at UVA. Um, there's actually, there's across different universities, but um, a couple of the ones that we'll provide are actually like finalists in this competition. And so the idea is that we're going to try and, uh, we're going to try and provide examples that'll help show you what excellent, um, yeah, what excellence looks like for each of these project components. Um, so the three-minute thesis is that uh, it's a three-minute video presentation. Uh, most students use Zoom for this. Uh, it's a pretty easy way to go about doing it. But the idea is that you, you're communicating the background, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the, what the significance, the importance is. The idea is that your three-minute th thesis, you want it to be compelling. Um, you want to uh, try and make it so that it's scientifically accurate, but communicates this in a uh, compelling and significant way. Uh, you'll want to make sure you're actually you're actually communicating your hypothesis, um, uh, what your approach is going to be, and what you expect the outcome is going to be. Um, you're going to be submitting uh, at, you're going to be submitting this as a pre-recorded presentation. So again, like Zoom is probably the best way to go about it. It's pro it's usually the easiest, uh, and you'll be submitting that on Canvas. Um, you'll have an opportunity to get feedback on your first draft, and then your final draft that you submit will be uh, graded again by the teaching team. Finally, your two-page research statement, uh, you're going to be focusing on a, uh, proposing a way to uh, address, uh, test the hypothesis that you have. Uh, you're going to be proposing your study and, again, uh, focusing on like what the significance is of this problem, what the significance is of your hypothesis, what the implications are, um, the innovation of it. Uh, for some students, uh, this might be a sticking point for them because they think, you know, I'm only the second year, like how, like how innovative can I be? It, we're at a moment in time where science is moving really quickly. Um, you know, there are things that have been, you know, the, a great example is uh, like uh, the, coronavirus, the coronavirus vaccine. Like that was a really unique moment in time, but like we're at a pace now where like science is moving really quickly. So there's actually an opportunity for students to have real innovation. Um, there are students who are in design discovery for like the last 10 years who actually like build companies out of what they propose in a class. Um, so I wouldn't limit yourselves here. Like don't self-doubt. Um, but like actually try and think of like really compelling creative ideas 
uh, and uh, try and try and push the limit of what your creativity can do. Um, we're going to test your approach, uh, what the impacts, broader impacts are. For the NSF fellowship, that's a really big key component. Um, and so again, let's, uh, to try and resemble that, uh, we're going to incorporate that into the criteria here. And it's going to match the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship as well as the Harrison uh, Undergraduate Research Award. Um, there's a fair number of students in BME who've done really well getting that award. And so again, that's the idea is to help expose you to what uh, writing those uh, things look like. And uh, you'll be evaluated on different portions of the research statement throughout the course of the semester. So that then when it's the time for the first draft, if you've been doing everything you've been so, supposed to do, you're just compiling everything together that you've written and making it flow in a really, um, uh, in, in a really smooth way. I'll let you take over here. I'll take this. Sure. I, uh, I don't have any pockets, but. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I'm pretty bad with the technical stuff, but I'm going to finish going over the rest of these grade components. So um, is there any questions so far about the other aspects of the project? No. OK, um, so the peer reviews are a part of developing these different components to the project. And as was mentioned, this is a really key aspect of developing science in general. You get to benefit from how other people are thinking about these disease concepts or the cell and molecular biology concepts that are underlying your proposal. So you really get to benefit from the whole group. Um, so yeah, this not only benefits um, your own work, but you're benefiting others by getting to share your perspective. Um, and this is just a standard for quality and rigor in the scientific community at large. Um, but it also allows you to think more broadly and to come at things with a different perspective, to um, incorporate feedback of your peers and other people that might be working on a slightly different project, but the same disease concept or um, similar types of ideas. Um, so getting a, a peer review that is well done is somewhat of an art. Um, and I think there's a lot of people, myself included, that are still learning this process. So it's a good thing to get to practice in general, just for working in teams too. Um, how do you provide feedback that's helpful to others? Um, so good peer reviews are going to be um, considered in terms of your grade. Um, so these should be unambiguous. So very clear about the type of feedback um, you're giving, what specific part of the figure design or the two-page research statement is not super clear, what needs more um, explanation or further details. Um, they should be well thought through. So insightful comments. This isn't something that you just do in passing time, but I think similar to other concepts in the class, it's helpful to take other people's ideas and sit with them and think, how could these be improved upon? How What um, advice or comments could I give that would improve on this statement? Um, and these can be both general and specific. So the idea is this is a first draft. So you can offer broad direction-based feedback, or you can give really specific feedback as to like how exactly is this approach going to work? Um, have you considered this limitation in terms of the results that you'll draw? Other things like this. Um, any uh, questions about this? All right, and I think it'll come a little bit more as you get to work on it. Um, and again, we're open to questions as you guys are putting these peer reviews together. You'll get some practice working on it for the different aspects of this project. All right, one aspect of this course that is actually new this semester, I'm super excited about it, um, are the inclusion of journal clubs. So you'll see on the course calendar, the different journal clubs that we've incorporated. And these are helpful for a number of things. So for your project, like we were mentioning, you'll be using primary resources. So this is taking research articles, reading them, taking the main conclusions from these research articles and building upon them to propose your own study or utilizing their knowledge into your proposal in some way. Um, but reading research articles is not trivial. Um, there's a lot to learn in terms of how you approach research articles, what kinds of questions you can ask, how to understand what's going on, even how to read some of the figures that are in there. What are the 
written and unwritten things that help you kind of decipher these papers. So we think that these journal clubs will be really helpful in terms of doing this. Um, so how this is gonna be structured, these are in-class activities. Um, so this will be about 20 to 25 minutes at the end of class following a lecture. Um, and we will assign you into groups. So these will be fairly large groups just because this is a, a big class. So usually about six, seven, maybe even eight people um, will work together to understand one part of a figure. So 20 minutes is not a lot of time to understand a research paper. So we're trying to incorporate this collaborative environment um, and having the pieces of information that you need to understand more modular so that it's achievable in this time. Um, so these will be randomly assigned and will be different for each journal club. So it will also help as if some of you are new to the major or just getting to meet each other this year. I'm sure you had classes together last semester too, but um, just in terms of building community, you'll get to meet different people in the class um, and work with everyone. So maybe that can benefit you when you're studying for your final exams or other unit exams. Um, and they'll be four throughout the semester. So just one per unit. Um, the grade for this is, is primarily participation. So I, this is a big feat. And especially because this is new to the class, we don't expect you to pick it up right away or hit the ground running. This is more of a, a practice exercise, a learning activity um, so that you can gain confidence in tackling these papers that you'll be utilizing for your project. Um, so it would um, be helpful if you are around and are actively participating, but um, yeah, that's the, the way that the grade will work for this. So a little bit more about um, what purpose this serves. So we'll try to connect um, the paper that we do for the journal club to the lecture material from that day. So it'll be really fresh. Um, there'll be opportunities to apply this um, lecture material directly to cutting edge science. Um, some of them, actually our first journal club paper will be from a researcher here at UVA, um, which is exciting. Um, somebody that both Dr. Ababayu and I have worked with extensively. So um, it'll be a good opportunity to both immerse you more in the research that's going on here at UVA and beyond, as well as in the topic that we're trying to learn for the quizzes and exams. Um, like I mentioned, this is good practice. Reading papers in the literature, it really just comes with practice. So if anything, this is just a good opportunity to um, increase your exposure. Um, and then I think the, the team aspects of this is really key. So um, if you have this challenge in front of you, you only have 20 minutes to conquer it. You have a team of multiple people. I think there's always the temptation of, I wanna figure this all out on my own, but I think this is a really good opportunity to divide and conquer, to, to take on different pieces, to be looking into different aspects of it all in parallel, and then to bring your understanding together at the end, which can be really satisfying um, and exciting. Um, so at the end of those 20 minutes, after you've worked with your team on understanding this part of the figure, every group is gonna go around and one person will communicate what the takeaways of that figure are. So what is the figure um, trying to get across? What key information um, is this figure communicating? And maybe just high level information about the method that was used. You don't have to go into extreme detail about this. You're welcome to look into this as deeply as you might be interested, but um, these will be really short, just about one minute summaries of your figure. Um, so hopefully the people that are a little more extroverted and um, willing to speak up can volunteer um, but you won't have to do it every time since there's only four. Uh, is there any questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, really good question. Thank you for that clarification. There's one main research paper. Um, each group will have different um, figures from that paper. So usually figures have multiple panels. We split those panels up so that it's really kind of digestible pieces of information and before the journal club starts after the lecture i'll give a little primer for our first one i'll give a primer about what is this paper what's the main takeaway so you have a little bit of context when you're going into it because if you're going in just looking at one small piece of a picture 
it's a little confusing unless you know what the entire picture is trying to communicate. So hopefully that'll be helpful. Um, also, the whole teaching team will be here um, accessible to ask questions. So this is not an, an exam in any way. This is totally open. You can ask either one of us, Nezwa, undergrad TAs. Um, you can work in different groups. So maybe you figure out you're part of the figure, but then there's another group that has a similar type of figure and you can work with them to help them understand it. So there's no bounds on this at all. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the slides will be posted before the lecture, which will have the information for the paper in it. Um, you're welcome to look through it before if um, you want to. I would say reading these papers can be kind of a black hole. So I, I think what I would caution you against is not sinking a bunch of time into it. I know you all have other classes and homeworks and things you have to do and study for. So um, other types of journal club classes that are based around discussing papers, you could spend hours and hours and hours trying to understand every aspect of this paper. Um, so we really try to design this in a way that makes it achievable in just a short period of time. Um, but again, having that broader picture is helpful. So if you wanna just look over it, maybe read the abstract or parts of the introduction to help um, ac acquaint you with the information, you're more than welcome to do so. Good question, thank you. Anyone else? Up the water. All right. And again, since this is a new aspect to the course, we're totally open to feedback. If you guys think this is a terrible idea to try to understand all of this in this short period of time, or these groups need to be smaller, other kinds of ideas that you think that would improve it, we're totally open to that feedback. We'd love to hear from you all. This is for your benefit. So we don't wanna be putting you some, through something that is incredibly ineffective. Okay, so one other thing I wanna touch on is the AI class policy. So this is something I'm actually really interested in and excited about. I'm sure all of you guys are aware of ChatGPT and other generative AI tools. Um, and these have kind of come into the university and swept a lot of things um, into a new era, different policies and ideas and faculty can stand in different um, ends of the spectrum on this. So one, we just wanna be really clear about what we, our expectations and hopes are for AI use in the class. Um, and two, I think it could be a really powerful tool and really help. Um, so in terms of just encouraging exploring it, I think there is opportunity for this to be useful, especially even in this journal club application. So. Um, if you're confused about what a method is and you want to ask ChatGPT, I think it could be a useful tool um, with some caveats. So I'm going to go through that. There's a little bit more information also in the syllabus. And again, if there's any questions at the end um, or after class, feel free to ask. Um, so AI in general could be useful for asking about methods or terms specifically, like I said, this could be really useful for this journal club. It could also be useful when you're doing your own um, project research. So you're trying to understand these primary references um, and it's taking a long time. I think this could help just understand these papers a little bit faster to get to the end goal of what is the takeaway of this paper? What am I trying to learn from this that I can integrate into my own ideas? Um, it can be useful for brainstorming. So there's different tools out there that synthesize information, like Nezra mentioned, um, about what is known about a disease. Um, there's different resources that might be more or less up-to-date. I think one caveat with ChatGPT is it's not always the most up-to-date resource. So this is something to consider. Um, this is information that you would want to cross-reference with other review articles or other websites out there. Um, ChatGPT, other generative AI tools can be really useful for um, writing help. Um, so in terms of writing, this I've found it helpful in my own writing for refining word choice, for looking at um, different synonyms of a word, for changing up my sentence structure. But 
Um, in terms of the policies for the class, there um, all of the work that you should submit sh is expected to be your own original work. So um, this can be helpful in terms of switching out a word, um, but in terms of like whole paragraphs or sentences, copying and pasting things straight from ChatGPT would not be acceptable in this case. Um, so we don't want to require use of AI in any way. This is um, still a new tool. There's not a lot known in terms of what information they're gathering from what you put in. So especially your own original ideas, um, I think it's good to be mindful of what you are submitting um, into these resources. Um, but it could be helpful for some of these different applications, like I mentioned. Um, and one really key caveat is, especially if you're using this to study or for things for your research paper, um, you should definitely be vetting information that you gather from ChatGPT or other generative AI with other primary resources. Um, if you can't find anything, you're welcome to ask the teaching team to send us an email um, to see if what you're seeing is really true. Does this make sense? Any questions about this? I know this is kind of a hot topic. Nope, okay. Okay, a little bit of the pros and cons. In terms of if or when you decide to use AI, um, this is totally up to your discretion. So it, it depends on what you want to get out of the class. Um, it can be a really effective way to synthesize information um, or to help you with writing, but if, getting really good at scientific writing is something that's really important to your long-term career. Um, maybe relying less on these types of tools would be of interest to you. So um, obvious pros, it's very efficient. It can help you spur on your own creativity. Um, it can help improve the way you're thinking about your writing, just being exposed to other types of writing. Um, but it does potentially reduce originality. I'm sure you guys are all aware it's pretty obvious to tell if you what types of writing has been generated by ChatGPT. It's got its own type of flavor. Um, there's no guarantee that its content is always correct or there's no small errors or biases. Um, and it is not a great primary reference. So similar to Wikipedia, um, citing ChatGPT is not an acceptable reference in this class and I think would not be suggested as a reference in other applications as well. Um, and then, like I mentioned, if practicing creativity and idea generation or writing refinement on your own is something that's important to you, then that would be a con of using this. So um, personally, I'm super interested in the way that um, generative AI tools could be useful for teaching and learning. And so I've actually helped design a study to try to understand this a little bit more um, that you guys will all be welcome to participate in. I will not be involved in the study during the class. The, my PI and the PI of this study will be um, talking a little bit more about it later in the semester, but um, participation in that study might allow you some extra credit and would help us in terms of just understanding whether or not you all think this is useful for your learning or not. So just put that in um, for a little um, tidbit for later. Um, Okay, so in terms of another thing that we hope to give to you for your benefit in this class is at the end of each lecture, um, we will be providing information about faculty that are doing research in the area that we have just introduced you to through, through the lecture content. So this can be a really useful opportunity for you to get involved in research if that's something that you'd be interested in. Um, I obviously love research, that's what I do for my full-time job, but um, I think it can be beneficial for everyone to get hands-on experience in terms of how science is done and how these kinds of ideas are applied at the cutting edge. And again, to contribute some of your great ideas and um, your perspectives on these things. So first, second, third year is all a great time. I didn't get involved until research until my third year of undergrad. I know a lot of people here do first year, um, which is really impressive, but 
um, there's never a bad time. So I just wanted to um, include a, couple, a little bit of information about how exactly you do get involved in research. Um, this was presented to me, similar topics in a class when I was an undergrad and that helped a lot. Um, like I said, we'll be introducing you to different faculties. So um, just knowing who to reach out to or who you might be interested in working with is kind of the first step um, and could be valuable. Um, I posted a quick little onboarding reference on the Canvas page that has a little bit more information, but both um, Dan and I, Nejwa, the teaching team, um, are all very valuable resources for getting involved in undergrad re undergraduate research. Um, Cooper, for example, works in the same lab as me, so we get to work together all the time. Um, so we're happy to just give feedback or other information that might be helpful. Um, UVA Engineering School is actually has a huge push for undergraduate research. So there's a whole um, document of projects that have been posted by grad students and faculty across the engineering school that are looking for undergraduates to re uh, researchers to work on. Um, so that could be a really valuable resource. There's also more information on the UVA Engineering page about how you go about um, getting involved in research. So that'll say a lot of the same things as the um, information that I posted, but it's good to build upon that. So both of those will be good things to look for. Um, that posted guide that I mentioned, and that posted guide was actually um, provided by um, one of the undergraduates that I know that is involved in this class called Sure. So um, it's starting an undergraduate research experience, um, and this is just a one credit class on Tuesdays that you could go to right after this class. Um, so this is a good opportunity also for a deeper dive into how to get involved in research. Any questions? It's a little bit more informational. Okay, coming back to the class, um, we talked about what to do before class. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about what things to do in class and after class. Um, so in class, we really just want you to think through the material as it's coming to you. So really would encourage you to resist the urge to transcribe every single thing that either of us say. Um, those recordings will be posted. There'll be references for you to go back to. You'll have all of that information um, with captions. I can't guarantee the captions are always completely accurate, but um, you'll have the slides, you'll have the recordings. Um, so what would be really valuable is to just think about the material as it's coming, think about how all of these topics are interconnected. So each lecture is one piece of this whole puzzle, but they're not um, isolated systems. They're all reliant on each other. Um, and so I think especially as the course progresses and you gain more confidence in the material, you can tap into that and bring that into asking new questions about the current material. Um, so yeah key part of this is asking questions. I hope we've already started to demonstrate this. We're very open to questions. We love the discussion. It really enriches this class. Every time I've gotten to be a part of it, it's really um, made the class better and expanded on some of the things that you can take away when um, you all are participating with your own questions and thoughts. Um, yeah, there's a chance that participation could be incorporated into your final grade too. So if that is an extra incentive. Um, yes, and like I said, transcribing is not necessary. I think key takeaways um, or other questions that you might wanna ask later if you don't wanna talk um, in front of the whole class, we'll be hanging around after class um, for you to ask those. Um, so those are all great things to do in class. Any questions about this or other things I've said? Nope, okay. Um, so outside of class, um, as we've already said, there's lots of ways to practice this material, but office hours are a really great one. There is an abundance of office hours, especially um, with how many people you have on the teaching team. So it is um, a really great resource to get to practice the material, um, to talk through it, even just to get to know um, other people in the department. It's um, always a joy. Um, 
And yeah, the vocabulary is something that comes over time. So flashcards is a way to practice, um, but this is more um, beneficial in terms of long-term learning when it's incorporated into other things that you're doing. Um, so rather than looking at a word and looking at what does it mean, talking about it in its context is more enriching. You're making more connections between that word and other things surrounding it. So from a science of learning perspective, this is a really valuable way to kind of solidify these terms. Um, the, do we have Piazza on this class? I think we still need to um, enable it. Okay. Okay, yeah, but Piazza is a really great resource um, discussion, asking questions, answering other people's questions, just another way to interact with the material. Um, and um, the project, as was mentioned, we try to put these um, deadlines interspersed throughout the semester to avoid the temptation of just pushing through the whole thing at the very end. Uh, again, this is for your benefit. I know I definitely did that in a lot of classes I was in when I was an undergrad, but um, the longer you work on something, the more time you have to think about it, really the better product comes out of it. So um, you'll see from the course calendar that especially towards the middle of the semester, these deadlines really do start to um, come quickly. So it helps to be working on it continuously. And this doesn't mean all of your time is spent towards this project. project. We know you guys have tons of other classes and work to do, extracurriculars, maybe sleep or other things that you like to do. Um, so we don't expect you to just be working on this project, but working on it in chunks here and there can be really helpful um, just for accomplishing this big task. All right, any other questions? Great. Um, so done going over the syllabus, talking about the course in general. What is exciting about this course? What will we be covering? Of course, this is cell and molecular biology. So everything that we'll be doing is falling under that. Um, but there's a lot of things that fall into that. Um, so a couple of the main points that we'll be covering are these main categories of biomolecules, and these show up in every context. Um, so we wanna give you the tools to take the knowledge and the concepts that you learn and expand them beyond the disease topics or the specific examples that we use in this class. And we hope the project is a good um, first step towards that, but I'm sure many of you might take other steps beyond that. If you're doing undergraduate research, if you're working towards medical school, if you want to work in biomedical devices or other things like this, it's not necessarily gonna be something exactly in this class, but something that you can use this information, and build upon it. Um, so lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, these show up everywhere. Um, and some of these fundamental processes, so transport across the membrane, replication, translip, transcription, translation, metabolism, um, these are all things that are happening in every cell all the time. Um, so this will really kind of lay the foundation for your understanding of everything else that's going on in biology. Um, there'll also be a really um, heavy focus on cellular immunology. Um, I think this has become even more exciting um, with COVID and the vaccine that's been developed. And this is Dr. Ababayi's area of expertise. So you'll be getting to hear from the expert on this. Um, and I'm excited to hear those lectures too. Um, as was already mentioned, these human diseases and ap applications will be present in every lecture. So you'll get to see how these ideas are tied directly to diseases um, in terms of how were these therapeutics developed? How did we make these advances to actually benefit human health? Which is really exciting. I think why most people want to do biomedical engineering. Um, so this spans the range from rare diseases, common diseases that you'll see every day. Um, a lot of these examples are kind of handpicked to be really closely tied to the concepts that we're studying, um, but some of them have a lot to learn still, and they're very open topics of research and discussion. Um, so these applications, like I said, will be very closely connected, but there's many other diseases out there that incorporate many of these biomolecules, processes together and are very complex problems. So still a lot to work on, a lot to learn um, in terms of this. 
Okay, any other questions about the class? All right, so figured we'd move to a little bit of background just so you guys can get to know me, your other instructors, um, to just know where we're coming from. And um, if you wanna ask about any of these things, love to talk. Um, it's good once you're starting to get more into the major, just to get to know more of the people in that major, whether it's graduate students or faculty, um, there'll be resources for you throughout your college career. So I am from Florida originally. Oh, oh yeah, classic, forgot. It always turns off and com comes back on in a couple seconds. So um, anyways, I'm from Florida, originally from Sarasota, Florida, which is um, by the beach, Siesta Key. Um, I went to University of Florida, for undergrad, so go Gators. If you know anybody from Florida, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, Gator pride. So um, just was down there for the holidays and got to step foot back on campus, which was nice. Um, miss the trees. They're uh, one of my favorite parts of that campus. Um, and Siesta Key has a, I don't know if anybody watches MTV anymore, but there was a rise to fame with the reality show, which actually has a lot of my friends from high school, which is funny. Um, <laughs> but it has this huge sign that's touted as the number one beach in the US, but it's been there since I was about two years old. So I'm not sure if that's actually accurate or not, but it's a wonderful beach if you ever get the chance to visit. Um, so like I said, I started undergraduate research as a third year undergrad. Um, I actually took five years to complete my undergraduate degree um, and I did this in the BME department, even though my degree is in chemical engineering. Um, I knew I was excited about biomedical research. Um, and so I got to work with Dr. John Dobson, who's a specialist in magnetic nanoparticles. And I was using these specifically for delivering genetic materials uh, to cells. So using a magnet to draw genetic material onto the cell so they uptake it and can express whatever you would want them to in that genetic material. Um, and this got applied in this really exciting paper that I got to be a part of at the end of my undergraduate degree um, that's more of an immunology focus. So this is using genetic material from a cancer, delivering it to dendritic cells, injecting it in a mouse, and the advantage of magnetic nanoparticles is that they're a contrast agent for MRI. So you can see whether or not these dendritic cells are migrating to the lymph node. This might be a lot of information. You'll understand all of this at the end of the class, which is really exciting. Um, but this is a really cool paper to get to be a part of. Um, and that made me really excited about grad school. So I came to UVA and um, started in the BME program in 2019 and joined the Cagliari Lab, which has been a really great time. It's been a fun four and a half years so far. Um, we work with hydrogel, biomaterials, and I particularly study lung fibrosis and the interactions between cells and their extracellular matrix. So I'm excited to get to lecture on that for you guys. Um, I um, met my husband in grad school. Um, this is a picture from our honeymoon this past summer. And we have a dog, Cyrus. He's a old man, golden retriever, but he still loves the snow. So he's pretty excited this week um, with all the snow. Um, we love to hike and go backpacking. I've gotten really into the sourdough game the last couple of years. Um, love skiing and sunrises um, and all that Charlottesville has offered. All right, I'll let you take over your background. Yeah. Sorry, I kind of ran long. Thank you. Uh -huh. I should also take note and say that at a recent conference in the Canadian Rockies, uh, we went to a ski resort and <laughs> when she says she's good at skiing, she's underselling it. I think she hit 45 miles an hour going down a mountain. <laughs> I topped out at 25. Oh, You're great. <laughs> um, the motivation here to share this information, and I'm gonna go through mine quickly uh, just because mine's far less interesting than hers. Uh, is that uh, I remember being an undergrad and I felt like all professors are probably the same. They just sit around in tweed jackets listening to NPR and jazz music. <laughs> and I would love to dispel that myth uh, to try and at least make us more accessible and also show that all professors come in uh, uh, with different, tons of different backgrounds. Uh, so like I said, I went through this program, graduated 2011, don't do the math. Uh, 
Uh, my background was in tissue engineering and biomaterials. I worked with, uh, who's, his name is Ed Bochway. He was here, but now he's at Georgia Tech. Uh, started working in his lab as a first year. Uh, I kind of got like roped into the lab by a fourth year student who I'd met when he described to me what angiogenesis was, this idea of new blood vessels growing from existing ones to meet uh, meet demands. And this whole that whole idea of tissue engineering and angiogenesis, like new tissue growing out that wasn't there before, sounded like science fiction and it, it like completely captured my imagination. And so I was just, I didn't believe him. So I said, like, just show me, just prove to me that it happens. And then they literally had this cool model where they would have, they'd have like a, it's like a window backpack model where you could actually see the vasculature in the back of a mouse. And over time, like actually see the change in the vasculature and like a, on a, um, in a time course. And so it was, it was pretty incredible. And so that's what got me plugged into research. Um, went ahead and did my PhD in BME at BCU, focusing on implants and uh, the immune response to them. Came to UVA, worked with Tom Barker and look at, to look at how immune cells communicate with fibroblasts and different forms of fibrosis. Uh, again, to dispel the myth of uh, what professors are like. Uh, I met my wife here at UVA when we were, when we were undergrads. Uh, she lived right across the street from me and so I didn't have to venture far. Uh, we have four kids, uh, it's a slightly outdated photo, but, uh, four boys who are wild and violent and kind of cute. Uh, we live in Richmond. Uh, we have a great community of friends and family there. They have 16 cousins in like an eight minute radius. So, uh, that's a huge motivation for staying there. As far as hobbies go, uh, uh, I will probably be grading all of your assignments with some sort of basketball game in the background. And if not that, then, uh, watching soccer in the background, uh, a lot of the music I listen to is old sounds, new voices, just like a lot of old rap and R&B or R&B that sounds like it came from a long time ago. Um, I love reading a lot of sci-fi and uh, a lot of good fiction. I genuinely, we're running over, I apologize. I genuinely, this is one last like tidbit of wisdom. Uh, I genuinely think like we need more scientists to read fiction and more artists to look, to read science. Just kind of, I think reading more will make you better writers. And so I highly recommend finding a good book. Uh, and I should also add, I will usually spend if you try and find me between like 11.30, 12.30, I'm usually at the gym. I'm usually, I'm pretty big into powerlifting and CrossFit. And so I have like one hour a day where I do that for myself. Uh, the last final thing, uh, I'm going to skip what I was doing in the second year. That's not really fun. Uh, I, I got to coach at a local school nearby. It was the best. It was a fun job for a college kid. Um, and what I'll say is the last thing is we're going to try and take, I want to make sure everyone can access question press. So take a laptop back out. <laughs> Uh, I want to make sure we can all access it properly, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here and open up the quiz.